Welcome everybody um, to this Policy Exchange event. Um, I'm Max Chambers, I'm the Head of Crime and Justice at Policy Exchange. Um, the work of my unit at Policy Exchange is all about being smart on crime. Um, so that's smart in terms of how we allocate resources across the criminal justice system. Um, smart in terms of how we treat people who come into contact with it. Um, and smart about the culture that we create. Um, so that people working in it um, feel empowered to innovate feeling that rather than asking permission to do things, um, there's more of a culture of just doing something new and asking for forgiveness instead. Um, and there are very few programmes that embody those principles, um, more than the one we're about to hear about tonight. Um, and we're very lucky to have three um, experts in the drug court and problem-solving court movement. Um, Earl Hightower, <coughs> who's worked on the front line um, of treatment and intervention over 35 years. West Huddleston, who is the chief exec of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, um, has been spearheading American efforts to expand drug courts across America um, and across the rest of the world. But before we hear from them, um, it's fantastic to be able to introduce someone who's, who's both a criminal justice reformer, but also happens to be um, a bit of an international superstar as well. Um, so, <laughs> this guy. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Matthew Perry. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stand up a little bit because uh, that's what I want to do. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the Policy Exchange for uh, flying me out here and putting me out here. It's been uh, wonderful being out here. We've been out here talking about uh, a bunch of different things. Uh, tonight I wanted to talk about uh, alcoholism, so I wanted to introduce myself and say that my name is Matthew and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Matthew. I'm Matthew. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. I'm Matthew. <laughs> I'm Matthew. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, alcoholics are very interesting people. They think differently than uh, most other people, normal people. And uh, when I was first getting sober, I would listen to these CDs all the time, and there was this guy named Norm A. And in this group that I'm in, you're not allowed to say the last name, so I'm going to have to say Norm A, although this guy's dead, so his name was Norm Alpi. <laughs> so I can say that. And he would... Uh, he would talk about how it was much more important to him how other people thought of him. What the hell was that? <laughs> what other people thought of him than what he thought about himself. And he would tell a story about uh, driving in Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard in a hundred degree temperature with the uh, windows to his Lincoln Continental rolled all the way up so that people would think he had air conditioning. <laughs> And I related to that, and of course, in perfect uh, alcoholic form, tried to top that story and have a true story about going up to my mom when I was eight years old in Ottawa, Canada. I grew up in Ottawa, Canada, which is a perfect reason to drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I asked my mom if we could paint a section of our backyard blue so that people in airplanes would think we had a pool. <laughs> That's the kind of childhood I uh, started out with. So um, I want to talk about alcoholism. I want to break down alcoholism for you. I'll tell you when I had my first drink when I was 13 years old. It was a bottle of wine called Anwar's Baby Duck. That's what it was called. It had a little duck on it. And uh, I was in Ottawa, and my friends, the Murrays, they had bought some beer and Anwar's Baby Duck. And I was an uncomfortable kid. I was, I, was, I was never comfortable in my own skin. I sort of, everybody was playing and I would be just sort of in the corner in the park just staring at my own hand. <laughs> That's the kind of kid I was. And uh, they drank this beer and I drank this Amwar's Baby Duck and I drank the entire thing. And I felt better than I had ever felt in my entire life. I was no longer uncomfortable. I no longer worried about anything. I felt fantastic. Now, I was lying face down in the grass. Uh, my friends had all vomited around me. I like to think that they sort of vomited around me in a circle, sort of marking the alcoholic. Mm. And 
alcoholism is a uh, progressive disease. So I look back at that and I wonder, well, wait a minute, that felt so good. Why didn't I just do that every night? Why didn't I end up just drinking that every night? But it's a progressive disease. It gets worse and worse as you grow older. So alcoholism. There's a lot of questions about alcoholism and addiction. And I'm going to talk about alcoholism and addiction like they're the same thing, because they basically are. So I'm going to talk about alcohol and drugs like they're the same thing. Like Vicodin is like powdered alcohol kind of thing. Um, what happens is alcoholism is a two-pronged disease. It has two different... Uh, it has two different facets to it. It has an obsession of your mind and an allergy to your body, okay? I wanted to walk down here, but they told me I couldn't because of lighting. So I just got to stay like sort of doing this. <laughs> um, so an obsession of your mind. So if somebody has a martini and I start to think about a martini, that's all I can think about. I can't think about anything other than a martini. I'm a, I'm a hockey fan, I love my family, I love my friends, but all I can think about is this martini and I keep thinking about this martini and I just keep thinking about it and I can't stop thinking about it and that's the obsession of the mind. And if I end up having that martini, then the second facet of the disease starts, which is the allergy of the body. Now the allergy of the body is something that makes me different from my fellows. You guys, for the most of you, who knows, but most of you, you'll have a martini and you'll feel a little, little dizzy and maybe a little tired and you'll laugh a little bit at jokes that aren't as funny and then you'll go home and you'll go to sleep. What happens with me as an alcoholic is I have a martini and my body creates this phenomenon of craving and I need to have more and I need to have more and I need to have more. And as I get older, I need to have more and more and more. And it starts to make you feel like you're really weak. You start to think, well, wait a minute, why can, I, why can I see my friends drink one martini with impunity and I can't? I need to have six and seven and eight. And it's because of that two-faceted disease, the allergy of the mind and, I mean, the obsession of the mind and the allergy of the body, right? So, what happens to me is I have a martini and then all rules are off. I've never had a martini in my entire life, because what what's the point? So I'd have a martini and then my body would say, hey, remember last time we had four of these, so we're going to have to have four of them again tonight. And that's what happened to me. And I had some ups and downs in my career, and I you know, got very, very fortunate when I, was, uh, when I was young, when I was 24, I got a very, very big job. But I was in this problem, and I couldn't stop drinking. And it got progressive, and it got worse and worse and worse and worse as it went on. So I wanted to ask you, as a room, is how, many, how many people are in here? 150? What do you think? 150 people? How many of you drink or take drugs? <laughs> Boy, am I hanging with the right group. <laughs> How many of you are concerned about the amount that you drink or take drugs? One hand. Two. Very brave, sir. <laughs> That's good. There are a couple of hands. Now, the World Health Organization in the 1970s says that 10% of you are worried about it. And that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about tonight. There's something about alcoholism somewhere down the line where shame came into play. And people started thinking, well, it's shameful. This guy's weak. He doesn't have the power to stop. And that's the message I want to bring tonight is that it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with will. It has nothing to do with power. It has nothing to do with how strong you are. It just has to do with activating these two things the allergy of the body, and the obsession of the mind. So, I ended, up, I ended up becoming a person that couldn't stop drinking. And I had a lot of reasons to stop drinking. And a lot of people told me to stop drinking. Some people were even police officers who told me to stop <laughs> drinking. But I had this whole high-profile job and everybody was on to me. And I like to tell this story because 
one of the uh, one of the ways that they can try to control the amount that you're drinking is they get you what's called a sober companion. And that, that, what that is is a guy who has about 20 years sober, you're drinking, and he has all this information about how to stop drinking. And if you really want to talk, if you really want to have a drink, let's just talk. We can talk, we can talk our way through this. And so I moved this guy into my house to protect my job. And I would say, Gary, I want to tell you his last name too, but I forgot it. <laughs> and I would say, Gary, thank you very much. That talk was very helpful. Thank you for getting me through the day without drinking. And then I would go into my bedroom and drink a bottle of vodka. And so one day, Gary, before we went to work, came up to me and he said, Matthew, I know you're drinking. And I said, Gary, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> because there was no way that I could stop drinking. There was no way that I could stop drinking. And I went to treatment a few times and I had a few bouts of sobriety and I had some friends who would help me and long suffering people that would help me and try to tell me that I needed to get outside of myself. That the secret to this was to get outside of myself, that I was self obsessed. I felt the need to self medicate. So I had to get outside of myself. And I would call this person and I would say, this girl, you know, this girl, she said she liked me. And then we went out and I had eight drinks and now she doesn't like me anymore. And I don't think that's fair and that really bothers me. And he would say, well, why don't you call Phil and find out how his day is going and maybe try to help him out. And I'd say, I don't think you understand. I'm the one who has the problem, right? So slowly but surely, I started to understand that the answer to what ailed me was to get outside of myself and think about others and care about others. So I wasn't so obsessed with myself, so I didn't have to medicate myself as much. So I started to do that because my drinking, I wasn't a partier, I wasn't a party drinker, by the way. I wasn't like, hey, yeah, woo, yeah, let's drink and invite 15 friends over and have a party. I was the kind of drinker that would be at home, drink about six drinks and watch like a Fellini film and pretend I understood it, <laughs> you know? Movies that were way over my head. I'd light candles and call myself an artist. But really what I was was a complete drunk. And I would sit there and I'd have these existential questions. How much, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? Are you good? Yeah. I, would, uh, have these, I would sit there and I would be drinking. The candles would be burning, the black and white movie on, and I had no idea what the hell was happening. And I would ask myself these existential questions like, why are we here? Why are we on this planet? What happens when we die? All these questions. And I would drink and consider myself to be really deep. And then finally the answer came to me. And the answer was that I'm here to help others. That's why I'm here. Um, it was pretty easy for me to think that I was here because of my career. I was doing movies. I was on covers of magazines and stuff like that. Um, I'm, pl I'm playing it low, but I do have all those magazines back there if you guys want to see them. Um, but was to help other people. So I started to do that. And I started to learn how to help alcoholics stop drinking. And there was a result, and it happened slowly, but I started to become more comfortable. And I started to become, dare I say it, happy and more comfortable in my own skin. And then the same guy who taught me all of this stuff, when I finally told him, I get it. I get, what you, I get what you were saying. Step outside of yourself and help other people. I finally told him that and I just pictured him falling over to the ground <laughs> because it had been so many years that he'd been teaching me that stuff. So that was the answer. That was the existential answer for me is that I'm here to help other people. The best thing that I can say about myself and I've had a lot of ups and downs in my life and a lot of reasons to celebrate and a lot of sadness and a lot of happiness. The, the best thing that I can say about myself is that if you are an alcoholic, if you're a person that can't stop drinking, 
and you walk up to me and you say, can you help me? I can say, yes, yes I can. And then I can back it up and I can do it. And that's what makes me feel better than anything else in the world. So this has led to some interesting moments for me in my life. I got hooked up with uh, Wes Huddleston over there, who's wearing a tie from 1973, <laughs> who uh, leads, the, uh, leads Drug Court, the uh, National Association, Association of Drug Court Professionals. And that's a group of people that, if you're not familiar, that's a group of people that takes first-time non-violent drug offenders and puts them through rehab instead of jail. Because these are people that wouldn't normally be committing crimes. They were committing crimes just to support their habit. So why take them and throw them into the prison system? And I started to work with these people and I started to really get moved by it. Now that's no different than the one-on-one -on -one work I do in Los Angeles with, with guys who call me and for some reason it's a very surreal thing now. People call me and they're like, uh, my girlfriend just dumped me, what do I do? And like, I help them and have the answer. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> I hope I'm right. <laughs> um, so we've had some, some surreal experiences, not the least of which uh, today. We met some very like social luminaries and political people today that were very interesting in trying to move this m drug court movement to Europe. And uh, one of the things that happened was we were brought to the White House in Washington. And I've been to the White House now. I'm not a political person, really, but I've been to the White House, I think, six times in the last two years. I've been to the White House so many times that a police officer in the White House came up to me and said, so you're just basically always here. <laughs> I want to point out, by the way, that my pants just look like they're unzipped, <laughs> but they're really zipped. <laughs> there's just something, there's a cut thing here, but it's really, it's really zipped. I just want you to know that. So, the drug czar of the United States of America, the drug czar, the guy who's in charge of all the drugs that come in and out of the country, he, does, he decided to give uh, me an award. So I'm an award-winning alcoholic. <laughs> and he did this in the Roosevelt Room in the White House. Now, I had been on the, the show The West Wing a few times, so I knew the fake Roosevelt Room, so I was sort of familiar with myself. And uh, he gave me this plaque, and it was this plaque of recovery because he knew that I dedicated my life to helping others, and he wanted me to have this plaque. And this is the story I told. I was five feet away from the Oval Office when I told this story. Five feet away. Obama wasn't there, but still. <laughs> kind of cool. One of the drugs I used to like was Vicodin, powdered booze again. It was a painkiller. And I used to take so much of it that, uh, pardon me for saying this, but you throw up a lot. And you get about a 30 second warning time before you throw up. So you're like talking to somebody and you're going, hi, how are you? No, it's good to see you. And then you realize, I'm about to throw up in about 30 seconds. What do I do? And I, so I would spend my night and I would get home. <coughs> this is, by the way, my acceptance speech at the White House, this is what I was saying. <laughs> and I would get That's home true. and I would race to the toilet, lean over the toilet, and start to throw up. And I had uh, two towels in my hand, one to wipe the throw up off of my face, and the other one to wipe the tears out of my eyes. And I said, at that moment, I looked up and said, someday, I'm going to get an award for this. <laughs> So, I have a lot of messages. My main message is this. If you're worried about having a drinking problem or a drug problem, don't keep it to yourself. It's a very isolating disease. The disease wants you to think that there's a universe at play and then you. And the answer, the beginning of fixing this disease is realizing that you're not alone, that there are other people that have this same problem. So my main message is to get it out there. A couple minutes? Yeah. To get it out there. If you're worried about it, tell somebody. Because if you just keep it a secret, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. Remember I told you it was progressive. So 
There's nothing shameful about it. It doesn't mean that you don't have power. It doesn't mean that you can't live an extraordinary life. I'm living an extraordinary life beyond my wildest imaginations. I'm happier now than I ever have been in my life. And not just because of how well this speech is going. <laughs> um, but there's nothing shameful in it. It's a disease. The World Health Organization in the 70s called it a disease. It's not a weakness. We tend to do things like compare our insides to other people's outsides. So we're thinking, well, I'm scared and uncomfortable, and I can't stop drinking, but that guy looks great, and he just had one drink, and he's, and he's fine. God bless you if that was a sneeze. If it wasn't, I don't know what the hell it was. Um, so that's my message. If you're worried about it, tell somebody. Because the truth is that normal drinkers don't worry about it. They don't really think about that. If you've asked yourself the question, am I an alcoholic? You're probably in. There's a test that they have, a 20 question test that they have at AA meetings. And these tests say, you know, have you ever missed work because of alcoholism, because of drinking? Have you ever missed work because of drinking? And when I was first drinking, I answered like two out of 20 correctly. Have you ever had an argument with your parents because you were drinking? Yes, I, yes, yes. But as my drinking career went on, I ended up answering 20 out of 20 of those questions. And then as my drinking career went on, I was like, if they invented 50 more questions, I would have said yes to all of them. But the truth of the matter is, if you're taking the test, you're in. <laughs> you're in. So. There's just no point in keeping it a secret. If you're worried about your drinking, you're worried about taking drugs, tell somebody about it. Because there's no point in living life alone. We're not supposed to be alone. We're supposed to be with people. We're supposed to be together. And that's what drug court is about. And that's what saved me. I kept it all to myself. Very few people knew the extent that I was drinking. And then I finally told people and got it out there, and it lost a lot of its power. So we're going to have some questions and answers tonight. There's a few experts on the stage to talk about a bunch of things, but uh, that's my main message. It's a disease. It's not a weakness, and it shouldn't be treated as a weakness. It should be treated like a disease that needs to be healed properly. Because if I didn't learn that I needed to get outside of myself and help people, if I didn't face my fear and go through that first night without drinking when I thought it would make me crazy, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be standing here. And I'd be of no use to anyone. And hopefully now, and I know this actually because I'm afraid to fly now. I didn't used to be afraid to fly. I was like, I'm flying, who cares? <laughs> now, if there's the slightest slightest bit of turbulence, I freak out because all of a sudden my life has meaning. Hmm. I'm like, well, no, no, I just found the meaning. The plane can't go down now. I just, I just figured all of life out. So anyway, I'm going to shut up. But that's, uh, that's, that's my message. It's not something that should be kept a secret anymore. It's not necessary. In fact, it's a hindrance. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, that was a really powerful um, explanation of how progressive and all-encompassing um, alcoholism is. Um, before we go into questions, um, we just want to have a quick overview from Earl um, and West about uh, drug court and problem-solving justice and what we've been having our meetings and our engagement with um, today and tomorrow. Um, so a quick overview of the concept, kind of where, where the US is, what the experience has been over there, and then how we're, we're going to be working together to try and establish um, and expand the number of these courts over in the UK. So over to you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm West. Um, so how many of you, by show of hands, 
If you knew Matthew when he was an active alcoholic and he walked into your house or walked into your place of work or walked into your life in some way, how many of you would help him? How many of you would do whatever it would take to help Matthew Perry get sober? Really, let me see your hands. I can't even... Okay. The one guy who admitted a drinking problem didn't raise his hand. No, he's like, no, I'm not going to... too busy. <laughs> I mean, whether you knew how to or not, uh, I, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room would be like, yeah, that's Matthew Perry. He looks to have a, a problem, and I want to help this guy. Um, and... What we're trying to do in drug court is look at every alcoholic or addict who walks into a courtroom in handcuffs in the United States who is there as a result of some drug or alcohol related crime get the help that they need. We're trying to see them all as we would see Matthew Perry. We're trying to change the way the criminal justice system in the United States sees alcoholics and addicts. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in the U.S., we lock up more of our citizens, and we incarcerate more of our citizens than any other country in the world. Uh, three years ago, we hit an all-time record. One out of every 100 adult Americans were behind bars in the United States. 2.3 million adults locked up in, this, in, in the United States. 80% um, of them are, are behind bars because of some substance abuse problem. Half of them meet the diagnostic criteria for addiction, for dependence. Half of them are drug addicted. And it just makes, to me, absolutely no sense. It makes, to Matthew, absolutely no sense. It, makes absolutely no sense to Earl Hightower. Why would we throw away people who are suffering, who have a disease, um, into a, a scenario where they're not going to get help, they're going to come out worse, and it costs a ton of money. It just, it's, it's idiotic. And so um, drug courts have been slowly growing over the past 25 years in the U.S. Um, as an alternative to incarceration for drug-addicted, alcoholic people who uh, are in enough trouble with the law that they're looking at some, some prison time or looking at a felony. And it's what we've dedicated our life to. Um, certainly what I've dedicated my life to, and I'm so fortunate to have men like I have, uh, that I share this dais with who who are willing to put their, their energy and time behind broadening these courts. And in short, a drug court, it's really simple. I mean, there's a lot of smart people in here. It's really common, commonsensical. Uh, we get people treatment who need help uh, instead of uh, put them in jail or prison. And there's a level of accountability with a court that you know most parts of the criminal justice system just can't bring to bear. So the judge in the United States, the judge is like the most powerful person in the criminal justice system, and they can, they can make decisions very quickly. And so we just we bring the person back who's in treatment for about a year, year and a half, two years, however long they need it, and we bring them back before the court every week to see the judge to check in, see how they're doing. And so there's a real, there's a built-in kind of accountability. We get them the help, and we follow up. And... 75% of people who graduate these courts never see another pair of handcuffs. It's really that simple. And it saves taxpayers a ton, a ton of money. So um, we, we came here. Uh, we recognize we have a much bigger problem in the U.S. than, than, than you do here in, in Britain or the U.K. Um, but we have found a solution to drug-addicted offenders that, that really, it really works. And so we... We thought we'd come over at the invitation of the uh, policy exchange and, and exchange this idea uh, with a number of your thought leaders. And it's great to be here tonight. Thanks. Do you want to say something? Reflections on, on the day? or I'd be delighted.
good. Uh, my name is Earl Hightower, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Earl. Hi, Earl. Hi everybody. Uh, would you all please raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> I had absolutely no reason to do Everybody else asked you to do that, so I just thought I'd do it too. I, uh, um, <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. I don't even know who you are. I, I, uh, this, I'm so jet lagged. I have uh, no idea really who we're talking to. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm here as a representative of drug court, and I, I want to tell you that drug courts work. Um, I've been on the front line of addiction for 33 years now. Um, I have committed my life to um, jumping through the looking glass as an interventionist and helping people get out of active addiction and into recovery. Um, I have uh, made a career of that and have been doing it for all those years. And it has been a remarkably rewarding, meaningful life for me. Um, to watch the lights come back on in, in the eyes of another human being uh, that suffers from addiction is um, like no other feeling on earth. And I've been addicted to everything under the sun. And uh, the biggest buzz I've ever had is hearing another alcoholic who's struggling with addiction suddenly look at me and say, oh, I understand. I understand what you mean by hope. Uh, that, uh, that there is a way for me to, to find peace. There is a way for me to find a new freedom and a new happiness. There is a way for me to be in this world, to be in this moment, to be free of the enslavement of alcohol and drugs. And when I looked around, um, um, as my career progressed, I looked around and I thought, what, um, how can I expand my service work? How can I uh, make best use, to, use of my time and, and become involved with something um, uh, of substance and meaning? And uh, um, through a series of strange circumstances, I ended up at a dinner in Seattle, Washington, um, because um, there had been a cancellation at an event for something called the Drug Court. And uh, I had been asked, do you know anybody of, of any uh, renown, any, any celebrity that might be willing to uh, um, come to Seattle and, and share their experience, strength, and hope about uh, how valuable recovery can be, how, how possible it is. And I said, well, it just so happens that I know a gentleman sitting at the other end of this, this desk um, who was wrapping That's a film. That's me he's talking about. He's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> who was wrapping a film just north of there. And I called him up and I said, would you be willing to do this thing? I'm not really sure what it is. And he said, sure, if you'll go, I'll go. I said, great. So I flew up and we sat around a table and that's when I met Wes Huddleston. And, uh, they started talking about this issue and that issue, and I, of course, couldn't keep my mouth shut and just jumped right in. And, and uh, we started to mix it up. And the next thing you knew, uh, I was on the board of directors of the uh, uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals and uh, was committing a tremendous amount. Every time my phone rang and I looked and I saw 703 area code, I went, oh, God, there goes my week. My phone number. He's talking yeah. about me now. <laughs> yeah. Because there would be West with, listen, I've just got a couple of things I'd like to ask you to do. And it would get out the paper and pad. This would be five or six things easily. And, we would, and it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings of my life, that I got to be of service in such a magnificent way that we got to uh, uh, involve Matthew, who is now an ambassador of drug court. I'm on my second term um, on the board of drug courts. And really what drug court is, is it is... Um, compassion with accountability. It is a court that takes currently 140,000 um, addicts out of jail and gets them into treatment where they belong. And the only reason it's only 140,000 is because that's how big our budget is. And uh, we, we scramble and scratch and claw to get our budget to grow every year so that we can help more and more and more people. Um, because what it does is it increases uh, the, the window of opportunity over a two-year program, and it um, creates the possibility for an addict to, break, to help break down the resistance of an addict to recognize their illness and do something about it. And um, as Wes talked about, we see recidivism rates dropping. We see the cost to the healthcare system 
Uh, we see family uh, drop, we see families reunited, we see the lights come on in the eyes of other human beings. Um, it's just absolutely a magnificent um, opportunity to be involved in. Um, and we were asked by the policy exchange to come to um, the UK and share what, what we have found. Um, after 25 years, that uh, we are the most successful social justice system in the American government. Um, and we're very proud of that. And we came here to share to say, um, we would love to help you in any way that we possibly can. Um, uh, you have problems as we have problems. And um, there is an answer to that problem. And however we can take the American system of drug code court and fold it into um, your system. Uh, we would love the opportunity to do that, to show you um, how remarkable the experience can be in watching a judge come down, in our courtrooms, watching a judge come down from his bench and hug a, a drug court graduate, um, to see tears of happiness flow in a court to see broken human beings heal. It's um, an absolutely remarkable experience. Um, and uh, I am honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Earl. Thank you. Right, questions, please. There's, um, Roving mics coming around, so please just state your name and um, <coughs> affiliation. We'll take one at a time for now. Tim. Thank you. Um, that was a uh, very enlightening and, and humbling um, series of, of talks. I mean, I get the idea of drug courts. It makes perfect sense. My, my question is really, there's two parts to it. One, the legislative side. Is there anything we need to do legislatively to make it happen? The second one is, because it works across multiple agencies, both the cost and the benefit. Who funds your budget? <laughs> uh, I, I will field the second question. Do you want to field the first? Well, I think... Um, if he comes up with a third one, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> um, I think on the legislation, Tim, we've got... Um, we do have a drug rehabilitation requirement on the statute book that, that could be used to do <coughs> a lot of what the drug court model is about. Um, the, one of the barriers um, is how to make sure you get the continuity of supervision, uh, so how to make sure you come back before the same judge or the same bench of magistrates over and over again, because of course over 90% of our criminal cases are heard by, by magistrates who are volunteers, and, and that can be quite hard to do, but, but possible. Um, but more broadly, I mean, in terms of reviewing sentences, Outside of, outside of drugs, so if you wanted to do this for sobriety court, if you wanted to do it for mental health, which, which the, there are models around for that as well. Um, at the moment, the Secretary of State has to give permission to an individual court to say, yes, you can review a sentence. Um, and what, one of the things that Policy Exchange is going to be calling for in January is to, is to flip that round and actually say, if a court wants to do this, if it wants to have enhanced offender accountability, if it wants to call people back so that judges and magistrates see good news about progress rather than the only thing they see at the moment is bad news when somebody comes back because they've re-offended, then the court should be able to do that. So um, th there is a legislation change that we, that we, that we need to make to, to broaden it out. But actually, we could do a lot of this stuff now if we had the partnerships available locally, the judges and magistrates who are willing to do this, um, and possibly some funding to, to make it happen as well. So in the, in the US, relative to funding, um, it's, a, it's a very exciting time. Um, uh, the way it has been up till now has been uh, the, starting in 1994 with the Clinton crime bill, which we still operate under. Um, we have to go back before Congress each and every year and fight for our annual appropriation. And it's been as little as 10 million a year for the entire country. <clears throat> and Thanks to Matthew, um, it's at its all-time high of 88 million right now. 
um, and that money is uh, used to train court personnel, starting with judges, and how to do this model, how to um, uh, probation officers, how to do this model, but more importantly, to fund the treatment aspect, the, tr the treatment that's so necessary to drug court. But with the uh, Affordable Care Act, the reason I said it's a really exciting time is with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, uh, we are potentially no longer going to be um, restrained by treatment dollars. With the Affordable Care Act passage, <coughs> treatment will be available on demand for anybody who needs it in the US for the first time in our history. And so if you think about it, um, yeah, we have 144,000 people in drug courts, but that's really constrained by the limitations of treatment beds, treatment availability in the community funded by the federal or state government, right? Well, those restraints are off. And um, I believe in the U.S. we're going to see the doors knocked down and uh, droves of people who are turned away from drug courts because there's not enough treatment dollars um, able to be in drug court. And it's a very exciting time. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And that's where we are in the U.S. Okay, next question. Uh, lady on the third row. Hi, Paula Reed, Rethink Mental Illness. Um, I'm just back from six weeks in the States looking at the mental health court model um, and went to a graduation ceremony, which was one of the most inspiring things I think I've ever done. Uh, there were tears, not just from me. Um, but what really struck me was the, and it, it kind of happens in this mental health drug arena, is the amount of co-occurring disorders and dual diagnosis. Right. Um, a huge number of the people going through mental health court also had a co-occurring substance disorder. And I was just wondering your thoughts on whether, and I know that courts, in, you know, problem-solving court movement in America is really taking off, veterans courts, DV courts, etc. Do you think we'll get to a point where it's not logical to keep splitting these things up too much, given that a lot of these things will co-occur and if we're treating people as holistically, then a lot of these things will, will happen to the same person or, you know, will be complex factors in their offending. So just really whether you see a point where stuff might move back towards a more holistic thing or do you think there's a real value in having very specialist defined courts? That's a great question. <sighs> um, no, it's, it's a very sophisticated question. Um, so what we didn't talk about are all these different other iterations of drug court, mental health courts, as she mentioned, is for someone with a primary mental illness, uh, some of whom have a co-occurring substance abuse disorder. Veterans courts, or what, what are known as veterans treatment courts, which are only five years old, um, that have sprung up as a result of uh, our armed forces being drawn down from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, coming home um, in droves, two, two million, uh, of our soldiers coming home and going into a veteran status, um, one-fifth of whom have a diagnosable PTSD disorder, horrible trauma uh, disorder, stress disorder, and one-sixth of whom have a substance abuse disorder. Most of that's being driven by either painkillers or alcohol, okay? <gasps> And so for, I'm just going to use the example for a minute of soldiers, okay? They're, they're trained to uh, kill. Um, they, uh, their skill set, so to speak, um, does not translate real well when they come home, especially after five, six, seven tours um, of uh, war uh, uh, each and every day. And <clears throat> they lose their unit. They do not have their brothers and their sisters any longer and they are um, incredibly alone and uh, suffering. And as a result, um, and this, this number should shock everyone in this room, um, 22 veterans in America uh, are committing suicide, 22 a day. So if you add that up, <clears throat> in America, more Veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan war killed themselves this year than we lost downrange on the battlefield in 10 years of war. So the real war is back at home, trying to um, get 
these particular individuals, some of whom have a mental health disorder, some have a substance abuse disorder, some co-occurring, the help that they need. Why do they need a specialized court? Oh, by the way, they're getting arrested at an alarming rate. Spousal abuse, road rage, kicking down the door of their neighbor's house, thinking they're clearing houses in Felucia, having a, a PTSD flashback. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and we've never seen it before. So why do they need their own court? Two reasons. One is by bringing them all together in a court, they find their unit again, right? They find their unit again and they don't feel alone, which is incredibly important uh, for the alcoholic or the addict. And, and Matthew spoke to that. There's a togetherness, there's a camaraderie. And uh, for soldiers, there's a very real camaraderie that's important to bring those guys together. The second is the way that, um, the way that in the US we're funded especially relative to veterans, we're funded, veterans services and benefits are all funded by the federal government, the Department of Veterans Affairs, which the UK doesn't have, but it's just the way we fund treatment and benefits for veterans, right? And so we can have the VA experts in the court cut through all the red tape and get them the treatment and the benefits they need right there. So it makes working with veterans who are in the criminal justice system who have a substance abuse or mental health disorder much more efficient. So that's an example of why we need these separate courts, right? It's a benefit. Um, I'm gonna answer the other, relative to drug courts and mental health courts. This model, a particular way of doing justice in a courtroom, is it's very specific and very different than a traditional court system. It's very different. And the idea of trying to take these principles and broadly apply them throughout the criminal justice system, uh, I think would be an abysmal failure, and I think the research has, has, has borne that out. That it, the, we really have to have a specialized court doing specialized work with specialized training personnel to, to actually get the benefits um, that we've been talking about, the low recidivism rates and the cost benefit. So I, I would like to think uh, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we wouldn't need drug courts, that every court's a drug court, every court's a mental health court. Um, I, I, I don't know if we're gonna get there. In the meantime, we're gonna keep growing drug courts and mental health courts and these problem solving courts. Okay, next question. Gentleman right in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Two questions. First question is in terms of your actual treatment provision, your drug treatment rehabilitation provision, have you developed that treatment service or um, do you commission community drug treatment providers to provide that for you, i.e., do you use a standard model? And the second question is, have you actually costed, um, what could you give me an indication of what the cost is, an average cost to put somebody through a drug court and a drug treatment provision in comparison with the outcomes that you would see in terms of you know, yeah. health and justice, criminal justice, <coughs> financial savings? Yeah, great, great questions, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, treatment is individualized in drug court and um, is, we, we utilize what's, the existing resources in a community. So in Brooklyn, New York, okay, or Memphis, Tennessee, or San Diego, San Diego California, or Miami, Florida, the, these, are, these are courts that operate in these communities and there are service treatment, mental health and substance abuse treatment providers that provide treatment to the, we call them participants or offenders, but participants in the drug court, okay? So, um, Treatment is individualized based on the assessment of what the person needs. Some, some people, we don't, we don't just cattle everybody through the same program. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, well, um, we, okay. Uh, so for drug court, um, for somebody who's drug addicted, and, and, and these courts are for drug addicted people, okay? So if, if, if you're not drug addicted, you, you don't need a drug court. 
Um, but if you're drug addicted and, we, and, we, and you're uh, lucky enough to get into a drug court in the United States, then the goal is abstinence. The goal is freedom um, from alcohol and drugs. Um, and so it is, it's ultimately um, a 12, a 12 step abstinence based approach. Um, we use a lot of cognitive behavioral treatment to deal with the criminal thinking stuff. We edu you know, get them into education, um, get them into uh, employment training, parenting training, you know, all sorts of life skills and add, uh, uh, additional services, mental health treatment. But at the end of the day, we're trying to get people clean and sober. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Second is, uh, so the, the average cost of, of a participant going through drug court is $6,000, which is nothing. C compare that to, um, <laughs> compare that to uh, sending somebody to, to, to jail 20, between $23,000 and, and $44,000 a year to incarcerate someone. Um, so that, that cost is, tr those are treatment costs and drug testing costs. The judge, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, all those people in the U.S., are, their probation, they're there. We're, we're just doing business differently. So the return on that investment is we save um, $3.36 for every dollar invested in drug court. That saves the police department uh, because the police department aren't rearresting the same person over and over and over again, responding to, you know, crime. Um, the, you know, children aren't being sent to foster care because the parents are addicted. Em emergency room episodes are way down because overdoses are decreased. So there's a there's a there's a huge savings up to uh, so three three dollars and thirty six cents for every dollar saved. And then when you start building in those community savings, less victims and the like, it, it actually jumps to twenty seven dollars for every dollar saved. So that's it's the hugely amazing, saving. That's the amazing thing about, uh, you know, in the American government, everybody argues about everything. Republicans and Democrats argue about everything except this because it does two things that are wonderful. It uh, saves lives and it saves money. So everybody likes it. Next question, uh, down the front. I wonder if I could ask Wes and Earl, uh, Jeremy Thomas, interest, interested spectator. Um, is the uh, medical, how, how is the medical evidence evaluated in these drug courts and what role do doctors play? Um, how far does the way in which the medical evidence is evaluated differ from that which in normal criminal courts and how far is it similar? And what efforts have been made to retrain judges who have previously served in um, ordinary criminal courts <coughs> to serve in drug courts. Yeah. Because in, in Britain, under the, you certainly under English law, one can have judges who have had a previous experience in civil law only uh, being put in charge of criminal cases, or those with a majority experience in criminal cases being put in front of, uh, put, you know, put in charge of civil ones. Okay, thank you. Eloquent. Yeah. Um. <coughs> So, you, in the U.S., the number one drug um, in the U.S. are prescription drugs. Are you aware of that? Yeah. So <laughs> I, it, I was too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there's uh, more, more deaths by uh, prescription drugs than car accidents for the first time in our history. I mean, we are a pill-popping um, country, unfortunately. Um, and physicians um, have un uh, unfortunately contributed to that in a significant way. Um, most physicians in the U.S., unless they're uh, trained in, in addiction medicine, uh, in psychiatry or specifically addiction medicine, know very little about addiction um, and tend to throw pills at problems in the U.S. Um, my, tooth my toothaches... Here's 60 Vicodin. My back aches. Here's 60 Vicodin. My, you know, um, and it, and there's not this holistic kind of environment. It's see the patient as quickly as possible, write the script, and get on to the next case because that's what makes money. And I and I don't mean to be so cynical, but that is my tooth and my back ache. That's uh, 60 yeah, Oxycontin. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, now, we're, we're, so physicians uh, really are not involved in, in drug court um, other, other than psychiatrists who are MDs in the U.S. Uh, or addictionologists, individuals who you know, are specifically trained in addiction medicine and, and help um, the addicted get detoxed through you know, maybe a medication for a period of time. Um, we would then call on a physician to um, assist in, if one of our participants you know, was in chronic pain, how do you manage that pain without, um, and still help this individual recover from drug dependency? Does that answer your first question? Yes. Okay. And I've yapped so long, I forgot your second question. <laughs> um, judges. judges. Training. Training. Thank you. So that one is really simple. Um, so in, in the U.S., you know, judges are uh, generally elected. And um, they're, they're, all, they're all attorneys, so that, that's a little bit different. So uh, all of our judges are lawyers. Um, they either come from prosecution or defense. And they are generally elected in the United States um, in, in a public vote. Um, and, in, and in some uh, states, it's even bipartisan, believe it or not. Um, I'm, I'm a judge running as a Democrat. I'm a judge running as a Republican. And, it's, uh, and so a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of our judges have, um, you know, really, well, they have zero training in being a drug court judge or dealing with the, uh, w with the addicted. Um, but they are all very experienced lawyers. They all are very, from whether they're a, a, a prosecutor or a defense attorney, they're all very experienced in, in, uh, in the process of, of, of court, okay? And um, so what they really need training in is they need training in what does it mean to actually have a, a, a conversation with a drug addict and help them stay in treatment? What, what does it mean to kind of get your hands dirty? That's a quote I heard from a judge one time. You know, I'm not a social worker, I don't get my hands dirty. Well, yes, you are, Your Honor. Uh, you're dealing with social problems and you need to be trained on how to interact with this person who's standing before you and how to fashion a sentence that's gonna have the best kind of outcome. And um, you need to know a lot about addiction and you need to know a lot about mental health and you need to learn how to be a, a leader of a team. So um, there is a lot of training that goes into uh, training a, a drug court judge, but... Uh, and in all fairness, a lot of our judges have been very, very available to that training. They've yeah, been, yeah. We do not have a shortage of judges that raise their hand and say, I really want to be a drug court judge because I'm really sick and tired of sentencing people to stuff that doesn't work, and I know that I can do better for my community, so... Okay. Uh, Julia, right in the back. You can ask uh, questions to Matthew, too, about <laughs> friends or whatever you want. Friends reunion? <laughs> friends the movie? Thanks, oh. Wes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Juliet Lyon, Prison Reform Trust. It's the what not to like question. Um, what's not to like? We, we know in this country that um, theft and stolen goods driven by drugs. We know that violent crime, public disorder driven by drink. We know that if you do public opinion polling, the public like treatment for addictions and understand it. Um, it saves money, we now know that. Um, we can see, I think, by the way you've presented, how effective it is. But I think there's a really big resistance here to doing this. Um, problem solving courts haven't yet taken off here, why not? Um, it, might, it might be a question to policy exchange, but there must be levers, and it must be about politics, probably if it's not about money, so what is it about? Why are we so resistant to finding solutions like you've described tonight? And why do we always seem to use prison and punishment to drive people through that hoop before they get the treatment and the care they need? Well, um, we were just at the Ministry of Justice talking to a bunch of their policy officials about why the drug courts that we tested in Leeds and London and um, some of the other problem-solving courts haven't taken off. Um, and I think part of it is about the way our system set up. So, you know, those, those innovations were conceived because the Lord Chief Justice and the David Blunkett went over to Red Hook and, and saw those models and wanted to, to have them over here. Um, and perhaps, you know, we haven't had the level of fidelity to the model that we might have had. 
perhaps we didn't do the judicial engagement that we might have done. And, and as a result, you know, you talk to those guys that we saw today, they all say, we didn't get the results that we, we were expecting. Um, so I think part of it's because we've got such a centralised system um, where we, you know, we, we don't allow for that groundswell of judges and magistrates putting their hand up and saying, I want to do something different. We don't allow that to, to come to the surface enough. Um, and then maybe as a, in terms of central government, we don't, we don't do enough to corral and coordinate and help those people locally to, to do this stuff. I mean, it's, that's the best answer I can give. But I mean, the, the other part of, of what we're doing is, is to try and re-engage the Justice Secretary, you know, the Director General for Criminal Justice Reform, people across government in this agenda, because it, it has, you know, uh, five or six years ago, it was, it was quite in vogue. Um, we want to try and generate some real momentum again um, and give it another go. Well, that's the beauty of why we're here. We have a system that has proven to work, so we want to spread that word so that you guys can use it here. And I, I've got to tell you that um, all day long, every meeting we've had today with a lot of different policymakers uh, um, has been extremely positive. Um, and there's been a lot of energy in these meetings. I mean, I've been in a lot of meetings in, in D.C. and we've stumped the hill and I've been around a lot of politicians here and there. And I know the difference between glad handing and yeah, thank you very much for coming and we'll see you later and, you know, on to the next thing. That has not been the case here. Um, the response has been very genuine, very real. The questions have been outstanding, um, in-depth. Um, um, uh, I sense that there is a concerted effort for there to be. Uh, what I want to leave here with when we leave tomorrow night is I want to leave knowing that we have an ongoing relationship and that out of that ongoing relationship we can build something significant, lasting, and of value for your citizens as well as ours, that we can learn from each other. And uh, um, I'm extremely hopeful based on the, the meetings that we've had today. Yes, lady there, just behind you, Fred. Thanks. I'm Fran O'Leary. First of all, is this on? Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the panel for sharing their experience, strength, and hope. Um, mm -hmm. I have two questions. The first is kind of just to get my head around the concept slightly more, which is. What's the difference between this kind of system and people here who do meetings in prison, for example? So what's, just to get my head around exactly what the difference is. And secondly, for those of us in the UK who want to back this, the introduction of this kind of system, what can we do to try and progress that? Do you want to talk about the difference? I mean, do you want to, or do you want me to? Well, um, I guess, the, the cohort that we're talking about, so short sentence prisoners will go into prison and may get a little bit of treatment. There probably isn't enough time or provision for that. Um, this is about making use of the, the resources that are already in the community. We do invest a lot of money in drug treatment in the community already, but it's about, for me, you, you may disagree, it's about putting a structure around that, that that's helpful rather than, than harmful. Um, so it's, it's, it's holding people more accountable for... for um, compliance and, and, and for the, their engagement with the program and, and with, with treatment um, and making sure that there's a proper system, which we don't have over here, of sanctions for when there isn't um, compliance and incentives for when there are. And at the moment, our court system, with, with a few very notable exceptions, is not really set up to do that. And didn't we hear today that uh, somebody comes out of jail after a drug offense and they're given 46 pounds and just left to the streets, 46 pounds, no treatment, 46 pounds and left to the streets. Those people have no chance. Right. So um, in, in the US, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's like night and day. Um, a, a traditional judge in the US would, would sentence, I'm gonna use Earl Hightower, so sentence Earl Hightower Hey, hey, hey. As Best well, you should. He already admitted to doing every... Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we're here to sentence you. Um, we, we'd sentence Earl, okay, on, a, on an offense. Um, best case scenario to probation, right? A community sentence. And the judge would say, you know, I hereby sentence you to three years of uh, probation. 
Um, and I'm going to make an order of that probation that you get treatment. Good luck with that. Next case. That's it. Guess what Earl's going to do? He's going to go celebrate that he's not going to prison, and he's going to go get loaded. He's not going to treatment. He, his probation officer will be lucky to hear from him. And the next time the court will see him is the next time Earl gets arrested. This time, he's a repeat offender. Guess where Earl's going? Prison, jail in the U.S. Um, we failed Earl on the first or second sentencing. We failed him. We didn't give him what he needed. Um, and we put it back in his hands to fix a problem that he can't fix on his own. In a drug court, well, and I don't really have to play out right that scenario. If he goes to jail or prison, he's going to use in prison and jail. I know you guys don't have drugs here in, behind bars, but, <laughs> but apparently we do in the U.S. And, you know, because you, you, you know, that's, that's a whole different story. But, you know, he's, you he's going to find his fix behind bars. He's not going to stop. And he's going to come out, and he's going to be worse. But I think juxtapose that to drug court where the sentence says, hey, Earl, you, you have an appointment in an, in an hour. Jeff right here on the front row of the courtroom is going to meet with you, take you over to the treatment facility. You're going to get an assessment and you're going to start treatment tomorrow. And they're going to literally walk him over to treatment and get him engaged. And oh, by the way, Earl, you need to be back here one week from today and report back to me, the judge, as to whether you followed my order this week. And we're seeing Earl now five days a week in treatment, probation. So it's, it's you know, and, and we're going to work with Earl for a year and a half or two years. And if he doesn't live up to the obligation, if he tests positive for a drug test, we're not going to throw him away. We're not going to revoke him or send him to prison or jail. We're just going to keep working with him. We're going to keep engaging him in treatment. Because we understand that addiction, you know, you don't walk into addiction in 30 days and you don't walk out in 30 days. It's a process, right? Recovery is a process. Earl, you do realize this is hypothetical. <laughs> Very happy to hear that. So it's, it's really, it's total night and day. But it's, it's there's, a, there's tremendous structure. It is compassion with accountability. You are held accountable. I've committed a crime. I get sentenced to drug court. Drug court is introducing me to the concept of treatment and recovery on a daily basis. The, the, the leash is very, very short, but the process is long. The window of opportunity is long to address my resistance to recovery. It's a very remarkable process to watch uh, individuals go through. That, and, and the goal being constant and ongoing exposure to recovery within the community and developing a relationship within that community. So that by the time I finish drug court, I'm so entrenched in the recovering community, uh, I'm, I'm rolling. I'm, I'm a part of something beyond self. Uh, that thing which every addict lacks. Right? The isolation of my addiction has been obliterated and I'm a part of something much bigger than myself. It's just a, it's amazing. <laughs> thing to watch. Drug court graduations, if you've never been to a drug court graduation, you've got to go to one to see, see it for yourself, to see the look on people's faces, because it's hard. It, you think they were high again. <laughs> <laughs> That's how happy they are. But it's, it's an amazing experience to, to go to a, 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 a drug court graduation. Everybody should. And, and I don't know what you can do. I don't, I mean, I, you asked that other question, what can we do, right? I mean, I, I know the policy exchange is, is leading um, an, an effort to um, breathe new life into this idea. Um, you know, look, 25 years ago when we started drug court in the U.S., they, they literally called the first couple drug court judges crazy. Like, this is crazy. Um, you know, today, there are almost 2,800 of them, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a day where there aren't 20, 25 
newspaper or television stories about the great work drug courts are doing in the U.S. And it just, it just takes some early innovators and champions to step up and do it and start talking about it and showing that it works. Change is hard, though, isn't it? That's what we're up against. I will right, we'll take um, two more questions. Um, Mehdi. Um, just to thank you all for very interesting uh, contributions, and I'm glad to hear you had so much optimism and hope today in your meetings. Uh, just to come back to what Juliet asked and what Matthew you said earlier about everyone likes this idea because it saves money and it saves lives. But of course, politicians we know on both sides of the divide also like to stay away from change on this issue because they're worried about being seen as soft. They're worried about being seen as losing the quote unquote war on drugs. Just a year ago this month, the deputy prime minister in this country said, the drug laws aren't working. We're sending too many people to prison. We need a royal commission to look into this. And the prime minister, David Cameron, came out and said, no way, drug laws are working fine. We don't need any change. I'm just wondering, you went to the Ministry of Justice, I believe you went to Downing Street too. What's your message to David Cameron? Well, the message today was that we have a policy that works and we have the data to prove it. And uh, we, everybody seemed very into the idea. It's like, I, 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 I feel this has nothing to do with me. So I, I, it feels strange to say this, but I feel like we're bringing this gift I feel like we're bringing this gift to just follow this program and it will save lives and it will save money. And I know a politician would not be very popular if they went on television and said, I'm turning down something that saves lives and saves money. And if you're a politician worried about being soft on, on uh, crime and uh, all for this quote unquote war on drugs, um, you can say that you've been paying attention and you've noticed that in America we fought a war on drugs and we've spent tens of billions of dollars fighting that war. It's gone just amazingly well. Well, you're talking about the just say no. That yeah. whole campaign made absolutely no joke. sense to me. Just say no to drugs. If I could just say no to drugs, I'd just be at home saying no to drugs. <laughs> It made absolutely no sense. Would you like this Percocet? Yes. <laughs> War on drugs. Perhaps what lay behind the question is, is uh, a, a question about legalization or decriminalization. Yeah. Do you want to just respond yeah, to that? Yeah, I can speak to that. So, you know, you may have read in the newspaper that two of our states have, have passed legalization of marijuana. And, um, what if the room just emptied? They just r ran to Colorado. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, just like locking everyone up is not the answer. Legalizing drugs is just as uh, much a kind of a thoughtless, <coughs> simplistic uh, answer to the drug problem in the U.S. Um, just give that one second of thought. If we legalize drugs in the U.S., what will happen? Will domestic violence go down? Will burglary go down? Will drugged driving go down? I mean, start listing off the crimes other than possession that will skyrocket because more people are using. And that is, uh, and, and I'm happy to debate whoever in the room believes in legalization in the US, but I, 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 drug courts would actually, we would require more drug courts in the US if we legalize drugs. Because more people will use them, drugs, more people, as a result, statistically, will become addicted to them. And then more people will have to do illegal activities, such as stealing, writing bad checks, drug to driving, spousal abuse. I mean, the whole list of crimes that our courts are filled with addicts already will just and go plus through the roof. Treatment centers are filled with people who are there just for marijuana. 
They are. They, you know, they, this whole ideology that it's not a real drug. I've been to the treatment centers. I've spoken to the people. They're oh, there for too. marijuana. So. Yeah, so. But this may be a debate for another time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's not a simple solution. Um, and, you know, I, Addicts are still, whether drugs are legal or illegal in the U.S., uh, people are going to emerge in the criminal justice system. People are going to emerge in the emergency room. People are going to emerge in places where they're going to they're going to need help for their addiction. Um, you know, I, I, less than one percent of those incarcerated today are there on a on a marijuana offense in, in the U.S. I mean, we're not. We're not locking up marijuana offenders. We're, we're locking up, unfortunately, addicts on meth and heroin and crack and, you know, but people who are doing serious crimes as a result of their addiction. Arrest the addiction, no pun intended. Um, you know, they stop, they stop reoffending. And the only way to do that is through treatment. It's a very good note on which to end. Um, can I thank you all for coming? Um, I think this is the last policy exchange event of the year, but I'm sure you'll agree it's been one of the more, most interesting and most powerful ones. Um, thank you to Matthew, Wes, and Earl. Thank you very and much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>